Welcome back to the Reflector channel. In this video, I'm going to show you how to buy your first used telescope and how to restore it. And I'm going to do that by buying a used telescope and restoring it right here in the video. And I'm going to share as many tips as I have for how to deal with all the ins and outs and the broken parts that you might run into. Let's go ahead and get started. For this video, I'm looking for a refractor telescope. The reason is I don't have one. In fact, I haven't had one really since I broke this stellar view that I had just for a brief period of time. Now I'm not looking for a cheap starter telescope. So I'm looking for a telescope in the range of about $300, which is where you start to get into that quality ramp and you start to get features that you won't find on the starter telescopes. The only problem is I only really want to spend about $100, and that's because I only buy used and broken telescopes. Cool bonus! Later on in this video, I'll show you how you can take a $5 part from Home Depot and make your used telescope look like a million bucks. Or a thousand bucks. Or just, you know, less homely, I guess. You get the point. Anyway, just stay tuned until the end of the video. So where should we look? Well, Craigslist and OfferUp are great places to start, but I found recently that the Facebook marketplace is a pretty good place to look as well, especially if you live in an area that has a very large population. So let's go looking for a refractor telescope. Okay, so this looks like a good candidate. It's a G Skyer 90 millimeters. So it's roughly three and a half inches in diameter. It retails for about $300, maybe just a little bit less, but they're only asking $120. And from what I can tell in the pictures, it's missing what might be some hard to source parts, such as an accessories tray. And I'm not sure how many eyepieces there actually are that will come with this. So I'll contact him and ask him if he'll consider selling it for $100. All right, so what's the best time to go meet with the potential seller of your used telescope? Is it day or night? Well, in theory, it should be at night, right? So that you can test the telescope out on the stars. But I found that in my experience, that's not necessarily how it all works out. If you buy at night, you're likely to miss some obvious flaws like outer damage or missing parts, etc., that kind of thing. Uh, and you know what? It's uh, usually cloudy. Also, if you're flustered from driving at night in heavy traffic, which seems to be the norm here in Dallas-Fort Worth anymore, well, you're going to arrive, your mind's going to be racing, and you may miss the obvious questions that you want to ask the seller. The only time that buying at night is really important is when you're purchasing a computerized telescope. And that's because the alignment procedures usually require it moving to point to a star and moving to point to another star. And you'll need to have a good view of the skies to make sure that that is all functioning properly. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick drive to go see this used telescope. Turns out the seller lives here in town, and uh, we'll see if we can make a deal. Wish me luck. 20 minutes later. All right, so I'm back with the telescope. I decided to buy it. I bought it for $100. And you know, I didn't test it out for a few reasons. First, I bought it up while I was buying pizza and it was kind of important to get home with the pizza while it was still hot. And secondly, uh, it was broken. In fact, it was a little more broken than I even realized in the ad and it wouldn't have worked anyways. Uh, the tripod's pretty banged up. Uh, we'll address that later on. But you know, this brings me to the first law of buying used telescopes. I've bought a lot of used telescopes, some so bad that you could barely see the earth with them. And not once has anybody ever said, you know what, this is broken, or this is a piece of junk, or this is just not going to work out. Instead, they all say, <laughs> works great. It's never been used. I use this all the time. In fact, if you've ever seen my video where I've restored that horribly destroyed Orion and telescope, the guy that I bought that from looked me in the eyes and he said, it works great, even with all the massive dents and missing parts. In fact, it had never worked at all, ever, because the person who assembled it had installed the encoder disk upside down. 
to be honest, most sellers are just unfamiliar with what they're selling. It's usually something they're selling for somebody else. Perhaps it's something they inherited. It's something that somebody left behind and they're just trying to get rid of it. So, you know, in some ways I can't really blame them. But just know that a lot of sellers are unfamiliar with what they're selling. And they can be so uninformed that they can take a look at this viewfinder and not realize that it's installed backwards. In short, try to be more knowledgeable than your sellers. Here on the front is a dust cap, right? Now this dust cap has something that your telescopes may have. It looks like a, a little tiny uh, lid. If you pull that off, it opens up a little hole right there. The purpose of this hole is to let in less light. It's great for looking at the full moon. Of course, this is not a safe way to look at the sun. Never, 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 never point a telescope at the sun. This is for helping out with the full moon. I'll put this back on and I'll take this off. Let's see if we can get a good look at that lens. It's a little bit tricky. No, oh, it looks it looks perfect actually. You know, I, I can't convey just how important these dust caps are when you're looking for a used telescope. 99% uh, of the time, if a used telescope has one of these dust caps on the front, the primary lens or the primary mirror is probably in pretty good shape. Now, if it's missing this dust cap, you can fully expect to find wasp nests or uh, spider webs or uh, maybe even a hidden cryptocurrency enthusiast. Let's get into the technicals on this. This is a G-Skyer or Gisker. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. 90 millimeter refractor. That means that the main primary lens is roughly three and a half inches. The focal length, which you will use for calculating your magnification, is 600 millimeters. And that's actually a pretty nice mid-range for a refractor. It's obviously, you know, not going to be as expensive or nice as maybe a stellar view telescope. But you know what? This is much nicer than a hundred dollar starter telescope. This one has some bonuses. First, we have this quick release hoops on it. Uh, that means if I were to unscrew these knurled thumb screws, uh, this would come out pretty quick. Uh, the main advantage of these, at least that I found, is that it makes it easy to quickly move this uh, up and down the body of the telescope to get the center of gravity just right for your particular mount. I'll go ahead and tighten these up so I don't accidentally uh, drop it out of there. Also, this telescope has this threaded front. There's a quarter 20 uh, bolt right there. And this is for attaching, for example, an accessory. That's the same mount that you would find on almost all camera mounts. And for example, you could mount your camera on here and you could almost use your telescope as a, 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 a pointer or a guide scope. On the other side of this hoop, of course, is this block here. This is a Vixen block. It's a uh, tapered. Let's see if you can see that. Yeah, it's kind of a dovetailed tapered look right there. Uh, the telescope industry has sort of adopted this as a standard. Uh, most really nice, expensive third-party tripods and equatorial mounts will come with a Vixen dovetail mount. So in theory, you could fit this on a $1,000 equatorial mount, which I do not have. Now, before we get to the focuser here at the far end, let's talk a little bit about this viewfinder. The first thing you might notice is that the back end of the viewfinder is crossly a good sign. It means that the previous owner removed it for some reason and then cross-threaded it when they tried to reinstall it. Um, also, if you're sharp-eyed about this, you may notice that it's actually pointing the wrong direction. Uh, when they put it in here, it's pointing backwards. So that may just mean it was either never used or it was assembled hastily. I'm not sure. We're going to remove this and it's just, we unscrew this little thumb screw here. And we're going to set this aside for now. Oh, look at that. That came right out. Okay, we're going to work with that a little bit later. We'll set that aside. Here we are at the end with the rack and pinion focuser. If you've watched any of my other videos, you know I'm a huge fan of the Crayford style focuser, mainly because these rack and pinions are prone to having a lot of slop. They'll, they'll basically crank either way, clunk, 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 either way like that. This one, um, this one's actually, this is pretty solid, actually. This one doesn't really move up and down. Yeah, this one's pretty good. This has some tightening adjustment screws on it right there. So maybe that's the trick. It also has a lock there if you want to lock the focus point in. Uh, let's see, it actually goes out pretty far. Okay, uh, you know, on this Gossier 90 millimeter, I, I have to give this actually a thumbs up. This one looks in pretty good shape. 
And let's see, let's take a look at this, these teeth. Now on a rack and pinion focuser, there's, there's this little uh, gear train right here, right there. I'll see if I can focus on that. See if you can see those teeth right there. Now, sometimes on these uh, refractors, we have this, this kind of rack and pinion focuser. You'll see a big swath of these, these gears ripped off. It's typically from this being jammed in. And the most common cause of that, believe it or not, is this being on the tripod. And maybe a wind comes along or somebody trips over the tripod feet. And this goes falling backwards and just slams on the back end like that. That will cause the main... Um, pinion gear to basically strip off a bunch of these teeth. Now these teeth happen to be metal, so that's going to be much, at least I think it's metal, that's going to be much less likely to strip, but it's still very prone to being stripped. If you're still shopping and you find your potential candidate telescope has a bunch of uh, shredded teeth there, that could be your opportunity or excuse to move on to the next uh, possible telescope. I do have a quick fix that will actually uh, repair that issue really quick and almost turn this into a Crayford. Almost. Uh, I'm going to have a video on that sometime in the next few weeks, probably. But anyway, if you do see a bunch of strip teeth, that might be a chance to uh, move on to the next telescope. So this telescope was actually missing the diagonal. And that's a part that you basically insert in the back and it takes the light path and bends it up at 90 degrees. That makes it so that you don't have to crouch down low to the ground and look straight up the back end of these. You can instead hover over it and look down at 90 degrees and your view goes up the back end. So again, it was missing that diagonal. This one has kind of a unique diagonal. I'll show it in the corner over here. And this one was totally missing. Uh, well, actually, what is that? Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so I, I got to carefully do this so it didn't fall in. I think we found the diagonal or part of it. This seems to be all that's left of the diagonal. Look at that. All right. So apparently the diagonal was either ripped out the end of this or maybe the previous user didn't know how to remove it. And so they just unscrewed it. So somewhere out there is the rest of this diagonal. What I'll do is I will contact the seller and ask them if they can find it. Okay, so I contacted the original seller and they could not find the rest of us. So what I've done is I've gone on the classified ad section of cloudynights.com and I bought a diagonal for about $20 and that's going to work pretty good for this. But, you know, if you know a good source for used telescope parts, please leave a comment down below. Before you go searching for a used telescope, it's super important that you know that the eyepieces come in three standard sizes. They are known by or referred to by the diameter of their barrel part, this part right here. This middle size, which is called inch and a quarter, is currently the most common standard. It's the one you'll see on almost every telescope sold today. When I was growing up, every starter telescope had these small eyepieces. They have a barrel diameter of 0 0.965 inches. They aren't inherently bad, but they are limited on how big the exit lenses can be. And, you know, they used to be associated with really cheap department store telescopes, which gave them a bad reputation. But, you know, with that said, there are some folks out there who have really nice ones that they are putting to good use. If you are given or inherit a telescope that uses these small eyepieces, don't worry too much because you can buy one of these adapters that allow you to put this in the small hole for the telescope and then you can use any of the modern standard size eyepieces that go in there. I have an Amazon link to this guy down in the video description box below. But nowadays probably 99% of all telescopes come with eyepieces in this inch and a quarter diameter. Prices run from as low as $10 up to $1,000 or more. Now, each of these eyepieces contains a series of lenses, and each unique lens arrangement has a special name. The best bang for the buck that I found is the Plossel style of lens arrangement. You can see it right there. It's got a little umlaut over the O. Now, they're not fancy, but they usually offer sharp views from edge to edge, and it's kind of hard for manufacturers to mess the Plossel style up. I like to call the Plossel style the Honda of the eyepiece world. They won't win any awards on speed, but you know what? They won't fall apart either. 
The last size here is the big guys. These have a two inch diameter and look at the size of the lenses on these. These are gonna be used in higher end used telescopes, generally telescopes that'll cost you $400 or more. These two inch eyepieces start at around 70 bucks and they go up very quickly, especially when you get into these coconut sized eyepieces right here. This is a two inch. Now, last but not least, I need to mention diagonals. They take the incoming light and they reflect it either at 45 degrees or 90 degrees. The 45 degree diagonals are usually found on spotter scopes, mainly telescopes that are used for looking at things on the ground where the telescope won't be tilted back too far. The 90 degree diagonals are used when you're using a telescope that's meant to be pointed up high in the sky. Uh, that makes it really easy to look at what the telescope is pointing at. Now, confusingly, this g sky telescope that we are restoring came with a 45 degree angle diagonal uh, when you bought it brand new, but I am replacing it with a 90 degree diagonal. And it's actually one that looks like the same style that came with the original. It's kind of half uh, spherical shape. So there you go. When you go out shopping for a used telescope, you're gonna be looking for inch and a quarter eyepieces. If it has a two inch, that's a bonus. These two inch eyepieces are so powerful that I can actually see you pushing the like and subscribe buttons. It means the world to channels like this. Don't be surprised if the used telescope that you buy is missing all of its eyepieces. Seriously, it's very common that they're just all missing. I don't know where they go, but unfortunately this happens a lot. This is the bag of accessories that came with this. We got a user manual that uh, gives all the specs on this. This, I believe, is the 90, yeah, this is the 9600. And it's supposed to come with eyepiece one, eyepiece two, and eyepiece three. So, so a 25 millimeter, a 10 millimeter, and a five millimeter, and a Barlow lens. However, it came with a 10 millimeter. And I have to say, it's pretty weighty. It's actually nice. And a five millimeter right there. And then it was missing the 25 millimeter. I also asked the seller if they could find it and they couldn't, they couldn't find it. So that's okay. I happen to have an old 25 millimeter that came with another used telescope that I bought. Uh, this one is pretty lightweight. Uh, but I think it'll do the job. So we at least have the three original sized uh, eyepieces. We got a 25, a 10, and a 5. Uh, but in all honesty, though, I will probably not use any of those. And I often will just use my Explore Scientific Wide View eyepieces because, well, I mean, why not? These were an investment. And on that note, you will notice as you buy and repair telescopes, you will gather a lot of extras and you're going to end up with basically a little box full of eyepieces. So you should have some extras. So whenever a telescope is missing a part, you can always pull one of these out of your extras box. Now, sometimes you can't buy replacement parts at any cost. And that's the case with this missing accessories tray that should go right there. So I went on Thingiverse and I searched for a G Skyer accessories tray but I didn't find anything, but I did find one for Celestron and it looked very similar. I checked the dimensions and they are identical. So I printed it out on my Creality 3D printer, which by the way, Creality is still not a sponsor yet. And six and a half grueling hours later, we had a new blue accessories tray. I tried to install it, but the outer pegs were a bit too long. So I ground them off on the grinder and voila, it fits like brand new, except of course it's blue. This is the tripod that came with it. Let's take a look. It has a bit of an issue in that it's a little bit floppy, right? Now, normally I would just tighten it and this should lock down the elevation, but it's having no effect. I think maybe there might be a loose bolt or something, uh, but I don't see any any bolt heads or anything. There is, there's a plastic bit here. It's like a little cover. I wonder if I, Ugh. let me get a screwdriver. I'm just gonna try to pry this off. 
there we go so it's just a little plastic cover and we have a allen head bolt and whatever this is it's kind of loose it's flopping around let me get an allen wrench that's pretty loose if i tighten it a little bit there we go let's see if that fixes it let's tighten this up well we got rid of the slop but boy there is just nothing i'm gonna put this up on the bench and see what we get okay so here we have it. it's pretty sloppy so we're gonna undo this big chunk of aluminum it's uh it's got a little pinhole right here or a keyway or something no key and here's a little uh, bushing it's a piece of metal with the plastic on the outside uh, it's got a gap here I'm guessing that gap I'm gonna guess that gap should not be anywhere near this although I mean it probably doesn't matter if I can turn that the um, oh there's a little there's a little cylinder. A little cylinder right there. That's I bet you that's a little pin. And I'll bet that goes right there. Um, yeah, I bet that goes right there. Let's take a look at this thing, though. I wonder, does this spin? This probably stays pretty rigid. Um, let's take this off here. All right, so there's no, does that pop out? I assume it's a tapered fit, maybe? <clears throat> Boy, that's a pretty tight fit. What are the chances this is the same thread? That seems to be the same thread. purpose of this is to just rotate that so the little gap is back here oh so close if only I had three hands basically I need to uh, pry this open like that and have this mysterious third hand to come and grab this put it in we're gonna be creative here and I'm just going to pry this open as far as I can It's like a 32nd of an inch more is all I need. One more clamp. Will this do the trick? That's it. That did the trick. Oh, now it twists. Yeah. That's because I probably stretched out the metal quite a bit. So I'm going to leave that opposite there. Let's go ahead and reinstall it. Put this like that. We'll drop the key in. The key is locked in. Make sure this is super tight. Okay, put the cover back on over here. Make sure Saturn is facing the proper way. I'll put the little lock back in right there. Put those on. I'm put the arm back in. And hope it still threads. I don't think I messed it up. And there it is. That's actually, well, that works really well. So there's loose. It's not wobbly. Tightened. There we go. Okay. Problem solved. So the last thing we really need to look at is the viewfinder here. This is actually a very nice viewfinder. This has kind of a, a nice metal stem. It has a standard dovetail mount for going into the telescope. Uh, that means that we could, if we wanted, we could replace it with almost any viewfinder, including a, a red dot finder that would slide into the same mount. But we're not going to do that. We're going to use this one because this is a nice optical one. It's also a corrected image viewfinder. 
That means, uh, you know, unlike a, a standard kind of a low-end viewfinder, when you look through and everything's flipped upside down or side to side, etc., uh, this one looks just like what you're seeing. So it's very similar to what you get when you look through a pair of binoculars. So there are many things that are telling us that this is nice. The one thing that tells me that it's super nice, though, is that the way this is mounted. So it's got this screw, this screw, and then it's got this, which looks like a screw, but it's actually a spring. This spring is always pushing on the tube, and this keeps compression on it, and it allows for really awesome easy adjustment. So for example, you would aim this where you're trying to aim at and you would adjust it this way left and right and up and down with this screw and this would always apply compression. As I mentioned before, this is actually pointing backwards. Uh, so we're going to remove it and flip it around. So let's remove it. And, uh, so, oh, well, so this groove here should have a uh, O-ring in it, right? And it's, it's missing. There's no sign of any O-ring. Uh, I had a previous one where the O-ring just disintegrated, but this looks like it was never even put in. Uh, the purpose of this O-ring, it does two things. So you put that O-ring in that little slot, and when you put this in properly, okay, so the O-ring goes into this little gap there and locks it into place. It acts as a fulcrum, so when you're adjusting it, it, it gives you a nice pitching point. It it's, works really well. We're going to need to do that first, okay? So let's go ahead and get an O-ring in one, two, three. Just picked up an O-ring at O'Reilly's for 65 cents. Pretty cheap. And here we are back from O'Reilly's with the O-ring. And let's put this on because I'm going to show you how you put these O-rings on. It just goes on like this. And it's going to be pretty tight. Almost there. There's really no other way to get this on. All right, so that's the O-ring on there. It's it stretched pretty thin. And as you can see, it locks it into place. It doesn't rotate this way and it doesn't rotate any other way, but it does allow you to, for this to act as a fulcrum. So it tilts right there, right? Like that. So that's really, the O-ring has many purposes, but the previous owner had removed that back in. So let's go ahead and take this out. I mean, it's actually looking pretty good. This is what I'm curious about. Here's the back end. This has a couple of little stacked lenses in there. And it, uh-oh. Uh Let's see if we can see what's going on here. This isn't the end of the world, but it's a problem. You can see the crosshairs are broken. They're actually, one is laying limp and one is just broken off. Uh, and one end is broken off. Now, that's not the end of the world. Uh, I have a whole video dedicated to fixing the crosshairs on one of these viewfinders. It's not too hard to do. Uh, but I will say, let's do something a little bit special. In the crosshair fix video, uh, several of you recommended that I try using an old spider web as the threads on here instead of the, the really thin copper wires that are that are in here. And I think that's what I'll do. Let's do that. And I have to go search for some old abandoned cobwebs and see if I can kind of uh, make them into a really thin string. From what I've been told in the really high end viewfinders, sometimes they have uh, they use specialty spider web threads. So, so I was able to find some really, really fine spider web here in the garage. It was abandoned. It wasn't dusty like in the house. So we'll go ahead and give this a try. See how this works. The first thing we have to do is remove this little piece in here. It's just threaded and I'm going to use probably some, some needle nose pliers to get in there and unscrew that. Like it's like a nut. It's a lot of threads. Okay. I'm not going to mess with the lenses there because everything looks really clean. But I am going to zoom in on this so you can see it. This guy broke loose and this guy's bent. So what I'm going to do is I am going to take my file and file these off just like in the previous video. And then this one, same over here. It doesn't have to be much. I think the camera stopped, so I'm going to... I just put some epoxy there, 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 and there. And now we're going to put the spider web on. Let's get this out of the way. So there's one end. That's, that's one of the crosshairs. Out of there. All right, so 
See if we can zoom in on that. That's pretty good. When this cures, we'll put it back in. Okay, we're going to trim this. It's not perfect, but it is bright white, and it should show up a little better than the dark wires that I used on the last one. Let's reassemble this. Gentle breeze. go all done so we're going to do one last thing it's a bonus that i wanted to put on here you know really nice refractor telescopes sometimes have a handle that goes between this hoop and that hoop and you can pick it up and carry it and it looks really cool i have to admit this is just for aesthetics and a little bit of practicality so i measured this it's five inches i went to home depot and they have these cabinet handles that are also five inches and it's black. So it looks very similar in color. It looks pretty cool. This quarter 20 bolt, which is used for accessories like cameras, we have to remove this. And let's see if we can get this to work. There's a couple of screws that come with this too. We have to get these screws to go up through those holes. There's felt in here. So fortunately ahead of time, I went ahead and I already cut the felt out. Now there is the issue of the screw. I hope it's not uh enter. Okay, there we go. So that came out. All right, it's just a quarter 20 bolt. And let's put this guy in there. This one in here. And let's see. If we can do this pretty quick. Oop. Direction. There we go. Let's attach this one now. Make that nice and tight. Let's see if that looks, looks fairly perpendicular. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Let's set the telescope back in. Tighten these hoop bolts down. And look at that. Pretty slick, right? <laughs> that looks, that's pretty nice. I like that. All right. All done with that. It's time to give it a try. Here we are with the 25 millimeter. It's shooting through some clouds, so there's a bit of a halo effect. This is the view with the 10 millimeter eyepiece. Uh, you can see it's actually quite sharp. Uh, almost looks like a mineral moon image. There's only a touch of chromatic aberration out at the far edges of the moon. You can see it on the left. There's a little bit of blue tinging, uh, but otherwise that's not too bad. That may just be my camera setup on the eyepiece. Here's the view with the five millimeter eyepiece. You can see that it is uh, surprisingly sharp. All right, so I have to admit that, you know, buying a used telescope, it can be a little bit scary. It can cause a little bit of anxiety, but I hope some of the lessons that you've learned in this video have taught you that maybe it's something that you could try to tackle, especially if you get that one that's a fantastic deal and you don't worry too much about messing it up if you need to fix anything. So I hope that some of my tips on how to buy a used telescope and what to look out for might help you in your journey when you're trying to decide should you buy used or should you buy new. There obviously are some challenges if you buy used. You have to know more than the seller does typically and you also have to be willing to replace a few missing parts or reproduce them or outright fix them. But this one turned out really well. And you know, because this was used and I got it at such a good price, I felt pretty confident in putting this handle on it. And I have to admit, this handle makes it look like a $500 telescope in my opinion. 
Uh, it works well on the moon, and I look forward to using it on the planets. And if we get out to some dark skies soon, we'll get to see some pretty cool, maybe some deep sky objects as well. What's cool about refractor telescopes is they're small enough that you can keep them stored in your car, right? So you can keep them if you're out and about, if you're driving around on vacation, it doesn't take up a lot of room. That's one of the cool things about refractors. So is buying a used telescope worth it? Well, even if you have a huge budget, I do recommend that you at least once try to buy a used telescope. If not for just finding a fantastic deal, then the feeling of accomplishment that you saved a bit of older technology from the trash heap and you've given it a new life. And now you have a new toy to look at the stars with. Clear skies, everybody. If you enjoyed watching this restoration, then you might get a kick out of watching the restoration of one of the largest and heaviest Orion telescopes ever sold. Or take a look at this video where I basically have to restore the most destroyed telescope that I've ever seen. Both of them are pretty fun. Give it a try.